What up African world, it's Home Team here and I'm back at it with another video of African history, culture, and worldview. And welcome back to my series, A Closer Look. Today, we're going to be taking a closer look at the Bameleke people. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and supporting this content. If you'd like access to full courses and sources, or you simply want to show your support, you may do so by clicking the Patreon link in the description box below. The Bameleke are one of the largest groups in Cameroon, numbering between 3.5 million and 8 million people. The Bameleke speak a number of Bantu languages of the Niger-Congo phylum. The main language groups include the Gomola, Fefe, Nda Nda, Yemba, Medumba, Mengaka, Ngembun, Ngoma, Ngambale, Kwa, and Ngwe. The languages, however, are similar enough that people still manage to understand each other. The word Bameleke is a European corruption of the name of the Deshang people, who consider themselves Baliku, that is, the people of the whole in the earth. Thus, the name Bameleke is not an original term and carries a meaning never really intended by its people, although it has been embedded into the culture. The Deshang live in several provinces in the highlands area or the grasslands region covering the western part of the country. One thing that makes the Deshang a very distinguished people in Cameroon is their origin story. According to oral tradition, the Deshang claimed that they're originally from Egypt and that they left the Nile Valley in the 9th century. After nearly two centuries of moving across the continent, they arrived in their present location in the 11th century. The history of their journey from the Nile to the plateau of Western Cameroon includes tales of magic and even levitation of the entire population over wide rivers and deep chasms. In the middle of the 14th century, they began to split into different local kingdoms. The first of these kingdoms was called Bafasam, established by Prince Yendi. He was then followed by a princess, his sister, who also founded an independent kingdom of her own. A number of new people arrived, coming in wave after wave, according to their legends. Five separate waves arrived and were absorbed into the Deshang identity, including the original people of the area who they encountered upon their arrival in Cameroon. The Deshang are patrilineal, and a man's children are considered to belong to the father's family. Property is inherited by one single heir, a son. Men can marry large numbers of women and in the past, wealthy men could have literally hundreds of wives. Strict inheritance meant that wealth would not be split upon the death of a head of the household, and group cohesion gave other, less lucky sons the ability to share in their father's wealth, though not inherited outright. Families live in group housing, surrounded by their fields. Each village is governed by a chief, also called a fawn who has nine advisors. The position of Fawn is also inherited, and in the past, the decision of who would be their heir was kept a secret until after the Fawn's death. As mentioned before, the Shang men are able to marry a large number of wives. In general, the man pays a bride price to the bride's family, and all of her children belong to the family of the man. Men work to clear agricultural fields, but the actual farming is left to the women. Like many agricultural societies, women and children are important sources of farm labor. Even today, the Shang villages produce quantities of taro, peanuts, maize, and yams. Men are also engaged in trade and entrepreneurship. Starting in the 17th century, the Shang men have moved out of their home area as traders and entrepreneurs spreading throughout Cameroon. Following the introduction of colonial authority in the second half of the 19th century, the Shang traders and craftsmen have expanded into other parts of Africa and with colonial empires to other parts of the world. The Deshang are skilled craftsmen, though it's said that since colonial times, many of their skills have been lost. They have reputations as carvers of wood, horn, and ivory. Many of their sacred masks are made from cloth, heavily beaded, using imported glass beads. Several types of masks associated with different societies are still made to this day and many sought on the international African art market. Among the most spectacular of these masks are the elephant mask, which represent the power of the chief or ruler. It's said that the fawn has the ability to change his shape into that of a leopard, a buffalo, or an elephant. 
All three of these animals are the embodiment of what a fawn is, powerful, fierce, and willing to defend his people. The elephant mask is made of dark, often deep indigo cloth and covered in beads and cowrie shells, symbols of wealth that outline and fill in the main features, including large ears. The mask falls down the front of the wearer in imitation of the trunk. The person wearing the mask also wears a long decorated tunic, again of dark indigo cloth, and has a large feathered crown on the top of his head. Masks are worn during special ceremonies and at funerals of important men. The Kuosi society is the most important of the men's societies, and in the past was made up of warriors. Today, it's composed of important and wealthy businessmen, and even the Fawn himself may decide to wear a mask and join the masquerade. Christianity was introduced to the Deshang during the colonial period, and subsequently, there have been some conversions. Islam has also penetrated from the north, where Fulani and Hausa have come into contact with the Deshang people. Most, however, adhere to the religion of their ancestors that focuses on honoring the ancestors. The skulls of ancestors are kept so as to provide a place for the spirits of the departed to live. If it's not possible to keep the skulls, a ceremony is held periodically to ask for the help of the ancestors, even if there is no place for them to live. The Deshang have a supreme god called Si, though he had little to do with the affairs of man. Ancestors are appealed to and can send messages through illness and dreams. Women are seen to be the embodiment of fertility of the land. This is one of the many reasons why women are the planters and cultivators of the soil. Another thing I find very interesting about the Deshang people is their architecture. Their architecture is immediately identifiable because of how unique it is. It's one of my favorite architectural styles to be honest. One, because of its sophistication, but also because of its ideological purpose. Deshang architecture plays a critical role in the construction of social identity. Deshang ideology suggests that human beings and their dwellings are linked symbolically. At the core of the Deshang architecture stands the concept of status. Wealth and prestige are expressed in the ornamentation and style of Deshang architecture. It's one of the more fascinating aspects of traditional African architecture. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like these videos and want to help in its continued production, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace. Hey, hey.